Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I hope inshallah you are all well and we pray to Allah for having a great inshallah session tonight. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-aliyya al-azim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina abil qasim al-mustafa muhammad. وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوه وأكرمني بنور الفه اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزان علومك برحمتك يا رحم الراحم Alhamdulillah, we have tawfiq to continue our study of Islamic plan for life. In this session, we study a very, very important virtue in Islamic ethics, one of the most fundamental ones, and that is about trustworthiness and about keeping our promises. So we discuss these two things which are very much connected with each other. Uh, this lesson starts with a story, a real story from the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. During the battle of Khaybar, Muslim soldiers were very much facing shortage of food and then they saw a person coming with some herd you know with some sheep or goats he was a person who was asked by the inhabitants of the castle who were fighting muslims to look after their animals. He asked the Prophet to present Islam to him and he embraced Islam. And then he asked whether he can now give these animals, sheep and goats, to the Muslim army and to the Prophet and you know other Muslims to benefit. They were facing you know shortage of food, it's been in a war. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said no. In our religion, we don't betray trust. You have to find that person and give him back the animals that has been entrusted to you. Look at this amazing akhlaq of the Prophet which would not allow exceptions even during war. As we have in many hadiths, delivering the trust back to the people who have entrusted these trusts with us is necessary and it doesn't make difference they are believers or not believers, they are good or bad. as we have in our hadith and inshallah we will clarify this more so this story by itself if we really reflect on this i think it's enough but let's see what other discussions you know we have about this issue as we said in the discussion about truthfulness and maybe in different occasions also i have highlighted this that Islamic society and Islamic community is built on some pillars and one of them is mutual trust. If there is no trust between members of the society or members of community or members of family, life becomes miserable. Even if people don't do anything bad, but just the fact that you cannot trust them and you are all the time worried makes life very difficult, let alone if 
you have been betrayed and you know people have harmed you and you have to always guard you have to always watch you are surrounded you know by like thieves or liars or people who have no respect for your honor for your reputation it's what life becomes very very difficult but if there is mutual trust then there would be friendship there would be unity there would be no unnecessary tension there would be no stress and our resources would not be wasted our investments would not be in danger etc so this is a general principle and this is partly achieved through said truthfulness partly achieved through trustworthiness partly achieved through keeping our promises partly achieved through not uh, backbiting or you know accusing falsely etc so we need to make sure that this mutual trust is maintained and uh, indeed it's growing now let's see in a more detailed way what is the concept of trust in islam and what are the uh, conditions for the people that we entrust something and if there is any condition for the people that we have to give the trust back amanat in farsi we say amanat in arabic we say amana or amana but if we bring you know another word after it it becomes amanat for example inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal ard wal jabal in any way this amana or trust is something of value it can be a good it can be you know even uh, something a spiritual it can be a secret it can be i don't know a recipe it can be a, you know a reason for for example uh, success that for example a company has you know come with some formula for example that you know i know but i'm working for them and it's amana with me i should not disclose it to other people uh, because they have rights over it in any case anything of value that i have been entrusted with they found me a trustworthy person or i have committed myself to look after their trust and they leave it with me i should make sure that i keep it intact and give it back to them sometimes maybe they allow me also to use sometimes maybe they don't allow me to use it's according to their permission and advice for example maybe someone has a library he asks me to look after this library and he says you can also read these books and benefit you can lend these books to other people or you can let them come and read or no whatever he or she says as the owner someone who has rights over these books I should follow so maybe I can use maybe I cannot use depending on the advice but what is important is I should never ever betray and one type of betrayal is to delay sometimes people think I'm going to give anyway I'm not going to you know claim it's mine but why I should you know give it back quickly even delaying is betrayal if he has given you for one year it should not be one year and one day extra it has to be exactly as you have agreed you were not forced to accept amana but if you have accepted 
then now you have to follow all the agreements that has been made between you and that person. Abdullah ibn Sanan went to Imam Sadiq salam after Salat and saw that Imam Sadiq salam is sitting after Salat facing Qibla and is invocating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worshipping not as Salat but as follow-up for Salat. So he didn't want to disturb Imam but he had a question also so he decided to ask the question. The companions of Imams were very much sure that Imams are always happy to help them with their questions. So he said salam to Imam alayhi salam and Imam alayhi salam became happy when he saw him and replied to his salam. And he said there are people who work for this unjust government for the Khalifa and his you know governors for example and sometimes they come to me and leave some of their amanat with me I know these are bad people I know they don't give homes they don't have faith or piety is it still necessary for me to look after their amanat their trust Imam alayhi salam, according to this hadith, with his hand pointed at Qibla or to Qibla and said three times by the Lord of Kaaba, three times by the Lord of Kaaba, by the Lord of Kaaba. Even if Ibn Muljam, who killed my father, Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam, because you know Imam Sadiq is a progeny of Amir al Mu'minin, so he's a son of Amir al Mu'minin, not immediate son, but you know, this is the way it's also mentioned. If Ibn Murjam, who killed my father, Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam, leaves something with me as Amana, entrust me with something. I would give it back to him in the same condition. I would not say it's for Ibn Muljam, it doesn't matter if it is damaged, for example, or I don't give him, I give it to some poor people, for example, as charity. No. When you accept, maybe you, you don't want to accept, you don't accept. If you think that you cannot look after it, you don't accept. But if you accept, you have responsibility, even if it is given by Ibn Muljan. So, as long as the person who is entrusting us is concerned, we shouldn't make any distinction. Good people or bad people should give their amana back to them. As I have said many times, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was migrating from Mecca to Medina, had many amanat of Quraysh, the people of Mecca, who were fighting Islam, who were torturing Muslims, killing them, you know. But they didn't doubt his amana. And they left something here. And Rasulullah also didn't just say, okay, you know, it doesn't matter. Now my life is in danger, or Muslim Ummah are in danger, or these people have been killing us. So just we leave it, for example, in the home. And whoever comes and takes it, you know, fine. Or send a message that, you know, I am leaving, you know, for example, and you can go and find it in my home. No. He asked Amir al Mu'minin. To deliver this amanat back to their owners and then join him. It's amazing. It's amazing that in the first place, these people, despite all the enmity, they trusted Rasulullah. They didn't think that Rasulullah is going to change their behavior because they have you know, been very bad to him and his people.
Secondly, it's amazing that Rasulullah accepted to help them in the first place and then he did his best to give them back. Again, despite all the enmity, despite severe dangers which were there. If you are only moral in good days, it's not enough. If I don't tell lies when everything is all right, but when I am under pressure, I tell lies. I keep trust and I'm on a, when it's all right. But if I'm under pressure, if there's war, if there's shortage, you know, no, this is not enough. Islam says you must be moral, you must be trustworthy, you must be loyal, you must be honest, especially in the times of hardship. Actually, that's the main task. Not that it's not important to be or, or you know, honest or trustworthy in the good days. That's important, but that's not the test. That's not the challenge. That is not what is expected. What is expected is to show that you are consistent. And this can only be seen when in the times of difficulties and hardship we show our commitment. So this a story of Abdullah ibn Sanan is a very interesting story from Imam Sadr alayhi salam. Now, when it comes to me or you choosing someone to leave our valuables with him or her, our amana. This is different. Now, we don't leave our amana with every person. We need to choose reliable people, especially when this amana is something social, something belongs to people, to community, to humanity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala somehow, like for example, leadership. Leadership is a great amana. Or for example, you know, we want to marry our children. This is amana. I have to find someone suitable for them. Money is very important, but if you cannot trust someone with your money, how can you trust someone with your daughter? For example, or you know, with your community, etc. So, for giving amana to someone, then we have to be selective. For giving amana back, we cannot be selective. We have to give back amana to whoever has given us. But when we want to entrust people, we have to be very selective. Especially these things are highlighted in our hadith. That person should not be a liar. A person who tells lies, how can you trust him? That person should not be a person who is betrayed. If someone has betrayed in the past, he may betray again. Number three, it's not a person is not drinking khamr. Someone who drinks khamr, you cannot trust. This person can get drunk and lose control. Don't give your daughter to someone who drinks hammer. Don't give your business to someone who drinks hammer. Don't trust, entrust, you know, your values to someone who drinks hammer. This is another thing in the book. And also to the people who are not efficient, not capable. Someone who is not able to look after his own self or his own money or his own family, then I can not entrust him with mine or with my you know business or with my you know community, etc. So we have to be selective, especially when it comes to positions which are great amana of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whom to choose as a teacher, whom to choose as Arlen, whom to choose as a community leader, whom to choose as you know, Marja. These are very important. Or when we want to vote, 
whom to choose as a member of parliament, whom to choose as a, I don't know, prime minister or president, you know, different system. So we have to be very careful. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man etamana ghayra aminan. Man etamana ghayra aminan. Whoever trusts someone who is not trustworthy. Falaysa lahu ala Allahi dhamanun. Laannahu qad nahahu an yata minahu. Then, he has no right over Allah. He should not expect that Allah is going to compensate when that person betrays. Because Allah has told him not to trust this person. By the way, this shows, and also the next hadith confirmed the same thing, that if we choose someone carefully and apply all Islamic you know, teachings, and that person either changes his you know mentality and behavior and betrays or cannot you know fulfill and you know my amana is damaged Allah would compensate he comes to help us although it's not that he told us to do this but when we follow his guidance and then that human being is not able to deliver the task, Allah would compensate. In the same way that when I become ill, Allah would compensate if I have not contributed to illness. When I lose something, someone, my children, my family members, my friends, when I lose them, Allah would compensate. So, Hadith says, if you trust someone that is not Amin, is not trustworthy, then don't expect from Allah to compensate. Imam Bagr is also quoted as saying, if you know someone is a liar, and when he promises, he breaks his promises, and still you trust him. So if he speaks, he tells lies, not all the time, but can tell lies. You know, he's known to lying, telling lies. When he promises, he keeps. He doesn't keep his promise. And when he's entrusted, he would not, you know, give trust back. He would betray. So you know, this person has such a situation. And still, you trust him. Imam Bagher says that then. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the right to let you suffer and not fill the gap or not compensate for you and not reward you <laughs> because you have caused this problem for yourself you have not opened your eyes and actually you saw the problem and you know you closed your eyes <laughs> Not that you didn't open your eyes, you just closed your eyes. You say, you know, inshallah it will be all right. How can you say inshallah it will be all right? How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want this to happen to you? You are causing this problem to yourself. So this confirms that if I act wisely and then for any reason something happens, Allah would give me reward, Allah would compensate. Allah is always on my side. But if I was not careful and knew that this person is not, you know, known to be trustworthy, and still I left my thing with him. Or I didn't, you know, ask at all, just jumped. This is my problem. Okay. Now, the next heading is about trustworthiness being a measure for Iman, a standard for Iman, a criterion to evaluate someone's Iman, faith. Actually, our hadiths are very clear that 
if you want to test someone don't test them with some actions for example how long is their ruku or sujood la tanzuru ila la ruku ar rajule wa sujood don't look at someone is when he goes to ruku has long ruku in sujood long sajda although ruku and sujood are very important but these are actions maybe this person is used to this If you want to test someone, اعتبروهم بصدق الحديث وأداء الأمانة test them with trustworthiness and with telling the truth. These two never become like a habit that you do it unknowingly. Salat, ruku, sujood, fasting, you know, sometimes they become just habits. And people, if they don't do them, they feel bad. They do it habitually. Sometimes. Some people know always do it with understanding, with reflection, with paying attention to the requirements. When I say Ya Kana Abudwa Ya Kana Stain, I mean it, I am committed to the to the implication. But sometimes it becomes just a habit. But said all hadith in different circumstances about different issues, sometimes hard, sometimes difficult. And sometimes easy, sometimes, for example, I lose, sometimes I gain. This never becomes something that you do it without understanding. It doesn't become like a habit in that sense. Although you can make a habit of telling the truth, but it's not without understanding. Even if it becomes a habit, it's always with understanding. Or Ada or Amana the same. So it's a sign of Iman in our hadith. In hadith says, whoever betrays amana doesn't have faith. And if he or she dies in this condition, he would meet Allah or she would meet Allah while Allah is angry with him or her. There is a hadith that Imam Sadiq alayhi salam was told that Ibn Abi Ya'fur has sent you salam. Imam alayhi salam said, when you meet him, say also my salam to him and tell him, Ja'far ibn Muhammad said. So this is Imam's message for Ibn Abi Ya'fur and for all of us, of course. See how Ali reached the position that he had with Rasulullah. Perhaps it meant that if you want to get close to me, see what Ali had, which made him very close to Rasulullah. Imam said, see what made Ali very close and had a high position with Rasulullah and do the same. And then he himself answered to the question. He said, what raised Ali in the eyes of Rasulullah was the fact that he had these two qualities, Sadq al-Hadith wa Ada'ul Amanah. No leader wants followers or helpers who tell lie to him or to others doesn't make that much difference don't say you know I don't tell lies to him I tell lies to other people a liar can never you know make sure that he would not tell lies to his master because you don't have that control when you get angry when you are excited <laughs> you may tell lies to your imam as well and no leader can choose a follower as a helper, as aid, as his right hand, when he betrays Amana. So these two are very important. Now, closely connected to this issue of trustworthiness, we have the issue of Al Wafa Bil Ahd to be loyal to your promises, to keep your promises. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَأَوْفُوا بِالْعَهْدِ إِنَّ الْعَهْدَ كَانَ مَسْؤُولًا Keep your promise, be loyal to the covenant, to the treaty you make with someone. إِنَّ الْعَهْدَ كَانَ مَسْؤُولًا Truly, you will be questioned about your promises, your work, your covenants about the treaties that you sign you commit Quran also says believers are loyal and committed to what conditions they accept and again here whether the person that we have promised we have committed we have signed a contract whether that person is good or bad, it doesn't make a difference. If you don't want to commit, you should do it in the first place. But when you commit, it's no longer the time to think, to choose, to select. Unfortunately, we sometimes give a promise, and then later we realize, I cannot deliver this, or it's difficult for me. Whatever you want to do, do it before. If you want to see whether you have ability, you have means, you have time, etc., do it before you commit. It's very bad that we promise and then people rely on us and then we don't deliver. Or they have to come and keep asking and begging, you know, please, you know, do, you said, you know, this. When you promise, do it and don't let them be in need of coming and asking you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the only condition in which you can be exempted is when it leads to committing haram. al inda shurutihim for example, I said I work in this place for you. But now they ask me to do something haram or to compromise about one obligation. Then this is the time that my ahd with Allah, my covenant with Allah precedes. So I'm not a person who is careless about covenant or about his promises. No, actually I'm very careful, but I have another thing which is more fundamental and has been made before. I have amana of Allah and I have ahad of Allah, both of them. Every person has already a misaq, a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani adam Allah ta'budu shaytan innahu lakum aduvun mubin wa an i'buduni hadha siratun mustaqim So he has made an ahd with everyone and we are committed to it. Also he has given amana to us, entrusted us. My eyes, my ears, my tongue, my stomach, my everything that I have is amana. I should not use them against his will, which is actually against my interest and against interest of humanity, because he doesn't need anything. When he says something is haram, means it's bad for you, bad for everyone. Just you need to see the realities. Just you need to see a little bit distance. Don't be short-sighted, don't be selfish. Certainly anything haram is bad for you and for humanity. About wafa bil ahd or wa'd when there is promise, there are some beautiful stories in the book. One is 
a story that Allama Majlisi in Biharul Anwar in a chapter about Wujubul Wafa'i Bil Wa'de Wal Ahd, necessity of being loyal to your promises and covenants, mentions. A person says that when I was young and Rasulullah was young, we used to look after, you know, some animals, taking them as shepherds to feed them. So he says, one day I told him there is a valley between two mountains and we can take our sheep there and let them, you know, eat his grasses. He said he agreed and we decided to go there tomorrow morning. He said, when I arrived there, I saw he's already there with his animals. He didn't delay, he was there already. But I saw Rasulullah as a young person, he's not a still Rasul, he's a, you know, a still like ordinary person in the, in the eyes of people. So he says, I saw he's there, he has his animals, but he has not let the animals start eating. So I asked him, why you didn't let them, you know, go and feed themselves? He said, because we made a promise to come together and do this together. I didn't want to precede you. I didn't want my animals to eat before your animals come and maybe, you know, the best ones, you know, they eat. This is the commitment of Rasulullah before Islam. In another hadith, again in the same chapter in Biharul Anwar, Rasulullah had appointment with someone next to a rock and it was hot under sunshine. And Rasulullah was standing there. People told Rasulullah, Rasulullah, why you are standing there? You can come, you know, somewhere in under shadow. Rasulullah said, I have made an appointment with someone to meet him here. And I have to stay here till he comes. Because if I go somewhere else, he may come here and wait for me. He may not find me. Anyway, I have to stay here. We have about Prophet Ismail, Allah Nabi and Awali Salam, that he also had an appointment with someone and it, he kept there for some time. People, you know, were looking for him. Finally, they found him, people of Mecca, and they asked him, you know, where are you? We were looking everywhere for you. And he said, I have a, an appointment with someone here. They said, that person is, you know, not here. So they found that person and blamed him. So he went to uh, Ismail alayhi salam and apologized. And Ismail alayhi nabi alayhi salam said that if he was not coming, I was going to stay here till day of judgment, if I was alive, of course. Because it was a very important thing for Ibrahim, for Ismail. And he didn't want to be the one who breaks the promise. This is, of course, for the people who want to become a standards. He says, even if, maybe from Faqih point of view, it's not necessary. To stay there you know for such a long time but this is for someone that can be a lesson for others can be inspiration for others and this is for someone that allah says in the quran in surah maryam verse 54 <laughs> mentioned in the book ismail he was sadiqul wa'd so before talking about his Rasala and Nubuwa, Allah says he was Sadiqul Wahd. He was very loyal 
and committed to his promises. What are the factors that can help in being trustworthy and in being loyal to our promises and covenants? The very first thing is faith. Iman billah wal yawm al akhir. If you believe in God, if you put Allah at the top of every decision, and we know that we have to answer to Him on the Day of Judgment, then we will be very careful. We will not do anything that would displease Him. Number two, if as a requirement of faith or maybe as a, your natural quality or as something that you have acquired, if you are truthful, this would help because not to keep the promise or to betray Amana contradicts truthfulness because you have committed and you have to keep your words. Not to be mean, to be ambitious and to be honorable. These two are very important and whoever has these two would not do mean things like betraying Then there is a discussion about degrees of amanat and promises. Sometimes, for example, you know, it's a matter of, uh, for example, I don't know, um, one pound. This is, of course, important. You have one penny important. But it's one pound, sometimes it's, you know, 1,000 pounds, sometimes one million pounds. Sometimes I told, you know, someone that, you know, we go together to have a, I don't know, cup of coffee. This is very important, of course, you could keep your promise, but sometimes, you know, I said someone that, you know, for example, I do fine for you a house, or I do fine for you, a, for example, uh, a scholar, for example. So there are different issues, different levels of priority. You know, someone wants to get married, I promise to help, you know. So. There can be degrees. All of them are important. But some become more important. Not that some are not important. All are important, but some become more important. Or the promise, if it is made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is made to Rasulullah, is to Imam, it becomes more important. And of course, the utmost you know, importance is when is the promise between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the covenant between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or amanah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has given this amanah of free will and responsibility to all of us. Inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal arf wal jibal fa'abayna an Surah Ahzab, verse 72. This amana is something that we are all to be 100% careful about. How to make every choice. It has to be responsible. Every word, every decision has to be with full implementation of trustworthiness and finally there is a famous story that in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam there was a couple Abu Haydar and Umm Salim or Umm Sulaim both of them can be they had a son who was ill and the son passed away. The mother, of course, as a mother, you know, it's very difficult. But she was concerned about her husband and knew that her husband would be very, you know, much in pain if he comes to know all of a sudden that their ill son has died. So when the husband arrived, she didn't say anything about death of the son. Husband, of course, as, and she said she is in a good place or in good hands. Assured him that there is nothing to worry. And had prepared, you know, good food and, you know, 
made everything nice. The next day, she said to him that if there is an amana and the person who has entrusted that amana asked to give back and I give back, do you worry? Do you mind? He said, no, of course. If there's amana, you have to give back. Then she said, Allah had given us this son as amana and he himself has taken him back. And this man went so his wife, the mother is so patient, said, I must be more patient as a man. So he took it with patience and he went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and reported this to Rasulullah and Rasulullah prayed for both of them and for their progeny. So this lady had this much of understanding and what helped her and can help all of us is this concept of amana, trustworthiness. If anything we are given is taken back, we should not think that this is mine and someone is taken away from me. This was Allah's amana and now is taken away. I am of course sad but this is not end of dunya, end of life for me and in a sense I am also happy that so far up to now I was responsible now this responsibility is over Alhamdulillah up to now I did my job one of uh, people in Tehran I read the story many years ago that one of ulama of Tehran said this, that he had a son who was married and was ill. And he was very much concerned. He was, you know, spending time in the hospital and visiting him, you know, praying. He was very, very concerned. Unfortunately, he died. He has now family, children, orphans. He died. But then they saw this man. That was, you know, much more, you know, tranquil. Those worries when he, that person was still alive and ill are not there. So but they were surprised. They asked him, you know, what happened? He said, when he was ill, I felt I have responsibility. I should do my best to look after him. To make sure that you know he would be healed if there is any chance but now he has passed away and up to now he was looking after his family and children from now Allah is looking after them why I should be worried I will do whatever I can this is the mentality that we need to reflect on. You do your best, but if for any reason that amana is taken away, maybe you feel sad. Maybe you feel that that was something useful for good reasons, but it's taken away. Now, say, Alhamdulillah, at least up to this time, I looked after this amana, and from this time on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would look after it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken what he really what belonged to him so as you see this concept of trustworthiness is very far-reaching concept and it can help us a lot in personal life in your social life we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase in us all virtues, those that we have, we ask Allah to keep and grow. Those we lack, we ask Allah to grant them and help us appreciate. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make 
our community, a community which would be known by everyone as trustworthy community, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. How are you? Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Okay, alhamdulillah. You can hear me. My apologies for the technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for the session. Uh, just highlight to, highlighted to us the importance of truthfulness and trustworthiness um, and being reliable. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any questions from today's session. However, maybe I can bring a question from last week. Uh, which was from Islamic Plan for Life. So last week you spoke about Husnul Khulk and also in previous session you've spoken about desiring good for others. And this question is basically saying, Sheikh, how do we achieve balance so that people don't mistake us for being weak, especially in the modern world? Yes. Yeah, this is a very good question. First of all, we must make sure that we have Husnul Khulq. Unless you are 100% sure that you have Husnul Khulq, don't worry about, you know, people may think you are weak. Because if we keep thinking about this, then we will never, you know, make sure that we have Husnul Khulq. So first, we have to make sure that we have Husnul Khulq. And don't allow exceptions, you know. Keep working on yourself. When you are sure that you have Husnul Khulq, reliable people say you have Husnul Khulq, then you would be in a better position to realize that now, if this person is taking advantage, should I be a little bit you know, strong here, a little, a little bit, you know, harsh. I don't want to use harsh, but maybe sometimes a little bit strong or no. Actually, those who have uh, quality of Hosnul Khulq, they would understand better that because they have control over their nafs and for them Hosnul Khulq is very easy, very natural. They will understand when they shouldn't show this that much to someone. But those people that Hosnul Khulq has not become their quality, their malake as we call it, then there is great chance that it's because it's not convenient for them. They think, oh, this is not the case. This person doesn't this. For every case, they find an excuse. But if you are in general a person who is calm, who has good akhlaq, who accommodates you know people then he would realize that oh this person has a problem i have to treat him differently this person expects you know something which is not reasonable so my advice is that first you make sure that you have this quality this is established this is well rooted in you and then after that, you would be in much clearer position to understand who is going to misuse or take advantage and whether you have to now change your behavior or not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we have a very good question here from Brother Muzammil Jivraj. I'll just put it on the screen so you can read it as well. And it says, how do we choose someone to maintain our trusts if it is between our family or other than our family, if they are both trustworthy? And furthermore, can we make a split second choice on who our trust should go to when it is trivial? So I think the question is basically asking how to choose who our trust should go to. So if, if you have people who are equally trustworthy, then you have choice. Uh, but if uh, one is more trustworthy, then you go for the one who is more tr trustworthy. Unless it's not a very important thing and you want to you know, keep good relation and you know, just the fact that you know you show your trust someone you know sometimes can help them, that's another secondary issue. 
but always if it is something important you cannot take risk go for the one who is more trustworthy Okay. Uh, thank you very much. No. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our first session on Islamic Plan for Life. Again, I do encourage people to ask questions on the chat if there are any questions. If it doesn't get through today, inshallah, next week or in future weeks, we'll try to address them. So I'm now seeing the time as 9.05. Um, Sheikh, how long do you think we should take for a break? And for ten, the 10 minutes, inshallah. So inshallah, 10 minutes, about quarter past nine, we come back for uh, Nahjul Balada. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, alhamdulillah. Um, we are now ready for the Nahjul Balaga class. When you are ready, Sheikh, everything is fine on our end with the recording and the live stream. Thank you. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al aliyyil azim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina abil qasim al-mustafa Muhammad wa alih al-tayyibin al-tahirin la siyama wa baqiyyatillah fil-aradhin ajal Allah ta'ala farajahu al-sharif Allahumma akhrajni min zulumat al-fah wa akramni bin nur al-fah Allahumma iftah alayna abrab rahmatik wa anshur alayna khaza wa na'ulun mikra rahmatika ya rahman rahim Alhamdulillah we have to feel to continue our study of introduction to Nahj al-Balaq Ayatollah Mutahari rahmatullah alayhi continues his discussion about theology in Nahjul Balada. He says, unless we make a comparison between the logic and approach of Nahjul Balada to such issues in theology and other sources and other schools of thought and philosophy, we would not understand the value of discussions in Nahjul Balada. Comparison helps a lot. And he says, we cannot have, you know, very uh, uh, expanded discussion. We gave you already some examples, some topics of theology under the uh, light of Nahj al And now he wants to make a comparison. He says, the style, the method of Nahjul al-Balagha in dealing with divine essence and divine qualities is very special, very uh, new. Even for centuries it remained new and unrivaled. And it's only possible to uh, understand this with the help of the Quran 
the Quran inspired Amir al Mu'mineen in having such deep and new ways of dealing with theological issues. Some people who were surprised by seeing such depths and novelty, they said, these are not words of uh, you know, Ali ibn Abi Talib. These are said many centuries later by some philosophers, or these are you know taken from Greek philosophers. But he says, whoever is familiar with philosophy, Islamic philosophy and Greek philosophy, cannot accept this. Because if you know what was discussed in philosophy at that time, or even for centuries afterward, you would see that these are totally different. Or some people think, for example, uh, these are words of Mu'tazilites later and falsely or intentionally they are attributed to Imam Ali. But he says, no, there are big differences with the Mu'tazilite ideas. And even if there are in some issue similarities, so you must say that Mu'tazilites have learned from Imam Ali because although in Nahj al you don't have uh, chains of narrators documented, in other places these are all documented and also there are many other hadith from Amir al munim which are documented and we are sure that they go back to that time you cannot say no these hadith have have no history and all of a sudden Sayyidah Razi came and said this is said by Ali ibn Abi Talib no we have many many clear records before Sayyidah Razi rahmatullah what he did as we said in the beginning, was not to bring all of a sudden and you know from vacuum these hadiths, was that he selected and put them together as a book in three parts: sermons, letters, white sayings. Otherwise, these hadiths were there before. So, as an example. The issue of qualities of God. If you remember when we had introduction to Kalam, we discussed this. And also in this course, I said before, Amirul Mu'minin denies qualities of God which are additional to his essence. You know, he says, Kamalul Ikhlas, Lah Nafyus Sifat. If you want to perfectly make him one and consider him as one you should negate any qualities what does it mean does it mean that he has no sefa of course he has sefa it means nothing additional because there was an idea that they thought qualities of god are additional to his essence like us our knowledge is different from our essence we can gain it, we can lose it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge, power, life, etc. are the same as each uh, the same as each other and the same as the essence existentially. The only difference is the concept. We don't have few beings, the essence and then these qualities. Asharites believed in Qudama Thamania, eternal things which are Qadim, according to Ashad, very essence of God and seven qualities. So they believe in eight eternal things. For them, we have Zat, a sense, and then we have knowledge, we have power, we have Sam, Basar, Erada, Hayat, etc. Mu'tazilites denied this, but they denied qualities altogether. They said God has no Sefa. And there is only niyab, means he acts like someone who has knowledge. He behaves, for example, like someone who has power, but he doesn't have knowledge, he doesn't have power. There is a poem uh, I told Mutahari mentions, Al Ash'ariyu Bizdiyadin Qa'ilah Waqala bin Niyabatil Mu'tazilah. Ash'ari believes in 
زیاده means additional qualities معتزلات believe in نیابه means essence replaces or is you know filling the gap of qualities means he doesn't have qualities Ayatollah Mutaif says compare this to what Amir al-Mu'minin says in Mahjur Balad Amir al-Mu'minin says God does not have additional qualities God does not have limited qualities his knowledge is not limited he has infinite knowledge when an infinite essence has infinite quality they should be identical this is what we call Tawhid al-Safati to unity with respect to essence and unit uh, sorry with respect to attributes Tawhid al-Zati with essence Tawhid al-Safati unity with respect to attributes which means that all the attributes and the essence are identical existentially the difference is in concepts so big big difference between what Amir al says and what Mu'tazilites came to say later or for example about Kalam a speech of God you remember in the course introduction to Kalam we said one of the first serious discussion in Kalam was about a speech of God and some people say maybe the science of Kalam is called Kalam because it was discussing this issue of speech of God word of God some people have other saying for example they say the reason is because they used to say Kalam or you know a speech in this I means what we say about this what we say about that uh, so about word of God a speech of God or Kalam of God and you know, has very deep saying he says whatever and whomsoever he wants to create he says be and there it is but when he we say for example Quran says or here he says when we say he says kun, this he says is not like me and you saying kun. It's not with a sound which it comes or with a you know call which is heard. His word is his action. This is our analysis. We analyze the process by saying that there is will, there is you know call, there is fail, etc. But his actions and his decisions cannot be taking time, cannot come gradually. He cannot, you know, be thought as someone who says something, you know, be, and then after that something is created. No. So look at how Amir al looks at this issue of divine word, divine speech. And then he says, this is something that is the action of our God and didn't exist before existence of this thing. And if it existed eternally then it's be another god if this was eternal then it will become a second lord a second god so this is what you find deeply philosophical in natural balada and even many mutakallamin you know struggled and they couldn't find the balance many of them also, he refers to the issue of Akli, rational or intellectual goodness and badness. And he says, you know, many theologians, even philosophers, use this not only in social ethics or ethics of human beings, even they have taken it to the issue of taqween and you know what God does. But he says in Nahjul Balagha, you don't find any reference to this principle. I mean, only didn't have this principle, uh, you know. 
as a point of reference. He didn't find this to be doing what others thought may do. He didn't find it very appropriate for understanding the way God you know, operates. Then he, after comparing with some uh, means ideas, theological ideas, then he talks about philosophical ideas. And he says, you know, some people have said maybe these are taken from Greek philosophers and intentionally or unintentionally are attributed to him. He says, no. He says, not only it's not from Greek philosophy, even not from Muslim philosophers, even for if you go centuries forward and you reach people like Farabi and then Ibn Sina and then Khaja Nasir al-Din Tusi, if you come all the way up to Khaja Nasir al-Din Tusi, you find some of the things that Amir al-Mu'minin says is not highlighted in their philosophy. And it is when Mullah Sadra comes and, you know, brings a revolution and, you know, re, uh, rival in Islamic philosophy by introducing transcendent philosophy, Akhmatul Muta'aliya, and, you know, storing again everything in a new order and with new concepts and new principles, you see that now he has many ideas that reflect Nahjul Balag. And he refers here to an article by Allah Tabatabai Rahmatullah Alai. And he says, Hazrat Ustad Allahumiyya Tabatabai Ruhi Fida. Unfortunately, some people, when they refer to their teachers, they don't mention the name of teacher. Even in the footnotes, they don't say this is from, for example, my teacher from his book at all. Ayatollah Mutahari not only mentions his teacher, but not in the footnote, in the text. And look at the way he refers to his teacher. Hazrate. Ustad Allahumiyya Taba Taba'i Ruhi Fida. May my soul be his ransom. And he really meant this. He didn't, this was not taruf. This is not, you know, something that normally we say about people. If he says Ruhi Feda, it means that in his heart he was happy to give his life so that Allah Metabatawai can live longer. I just few days ago, because now we are actually, in the, you know, and we have just had the anniversary of the demise of Allah Metabatawai. I read just a few days ago uh, that the late. Uh, Allah Metabatabai and Ayatollah Mutahari uh, were together in uh, one of the cities in the province of Khurasan. I forgot was Fariman or another city because Ayatollah Mutahari was from Fariman. In one city, I don't remember exactly. And Ayatollah Nuri Hamadani, who is one of our Maharaja today, he says, I was there. And I saw them uh, there. Allame and Ayatollah Mutahari. And he says the way Ayatollah Mutahari was respecting Allame was exceptional. And he says when Allame wanted to make wudu, Ayatollah Mutahari was holding his Abba, his Imame, you know, like a child helping his old father. Although he himself a great alim, maybe many people knew him more than Allama in the public, not in the Hose. But he was so polite, so humble before Allama, you know, keeping um, uh, Abba, you know, the cloak of Allama, um, uh, uh, Allama, the Imam, the turban of Allama. And then when Allama finished and put it on his head, he says, I was surprised with this level of politeness of Ayatollah Mutahari. Or how Allah was with his teacher. 
And he says, you know, a person offered perfume to Allah Metabatabai, and he said, after Ayatollah Qazi, my teacher, has passed away, I have not used perfume. And he said, by that time, I think he says two years or something had passed, and maybe later also. He was not using perfume. So, this is the love they had, the appreciation they had for teachers, and we should also show the same because they are also our teachers. They are maybe they are not our immediate teachers, but when it is teacher of teacher of teacher, it becomes even more important. So, this is a key to success if you want tawfiq for learning, especially. You have to be grateful to Allah and to your teachers and people who are channels of knowledge. So, anyway, after this, he says that Allah Metabatabai, in an article in a journal, Maktab Tashayyu, which was published in Qom, two famous journals were published in Qom before revolution. One was Maktab Islam, one was Maktab Tashayyu. So in Maktab Tashayyu, Allama in the second article, in the issue number two, or issue number two of the journal, says that these ideas that we find in our hadith about theology were not known to Muslims, were not known to Arabs before Islam, and you don't find in uh, works of philosophers in other places which were translated into Arabic. You don't find them in the works of Muslim philosophers, Arabs and non-Arabs. And they are totally new and for some centuries remained untouched. <laughs> Maybe people repeated them, but they didn't understand them. It didn't become an issue in their discourse. A topic that they discussed and he says this continued till the 11th century so for about 1,000 years till these issues like remember we said that oneness of God is not numeric or for example, the fact that existence of God and unity, wahda, or musawiq, this is philosophical term, means they come together and they come from the same aspect. Oneness and existence for God are coming together and are two sides of the same coin. Or, for example, the fact that everything is known by God and God is known by himself. Because before that, everyone tried to prove existence of God by using different things. Even Ibn Sina, who thinks that he has found Burhan al-Siddiqin, and he says that Burhan al-Siddiqin is the one that you come to God directly and you prove the existence of God directly. But in reality, his Burhan, his proof for existence of God, still is not that direct. It's mostly a matter of Burhan al-Wujub al-Imkan and uses the concept of Wujub, which is good, but still is not direct because he doesn't explain why God is wajib is necessary it is mullah sadra who later introduces burhan siddiqin and uses the concept of absolute being which is god without referring to any creature or any contingent being so that he can come to god so these are the things that are in Nahjul balagh and up to time of mullah sadra were not that much discussed even by people like Ibn Sina who was a great philosopher and thinker and fully aware of philosophical heritage of Greece and 
Greek philosophers and Muslims and you know other per per Persia etc you know in the medieval ages they used to refer to works of Ibn Sina and other Muslims to understand Greek philosophy and later they were directly translated from Greek to Latin but before that was through Arabic he says Hazrat Ustad I don't know how we can translate Hazrat in uh, English. It's very difficult. Maybe you can say, you know, his eminence teacher, my teacher. He says, referring to a hadith from Imam Ali, which is in Tawheed by Sheikh al Sadur, says that the basis of this point in this hadith, which is from Imam Ali, is that the existence of God is unlimited because it's absolute reality and whatever is unlimited whatever is absolute is free from need and everything else relies on him but he doesn't rely on anything in any case he says what is in Nahjul Balagha which is the basis of all discussions about essence of God is that his existence is unlimited it's absolute there is no way to think of any limit for existence of god anything that can limit it can bring a modification for the existence of god no time no space no quality can limit his existence time space number quantity quality all these things that can limit they come later the actions in the things that he creates not in his essence and not in his essential qualities then he refers to theological ideas or ideas about God in Western Theosophy you know even Western thinkers were believers who were using philosophy but with theological commitments or with you know faith in God in their mind and heart he said unfortunately they faced problem many problems because they were not well prepared for dealing with these deep questions for example he says if you study the ontological uh, argument of saint Anselm, which is very famous and then what you know people like leibniz at spinoza you know descartes all have said about god and compare it to what is in natural balagha and later developed by mullah sadra you find a big difference so how can then someone says uh, you know these ideas in natural balaga are you know borrowed from greek philosophy even much later there is no such similar thing there so alhamdulillah we finished uh, this part and he himself also apologizes he says uh, i'm sorry that the first two parts are very you know technical but this is the way you have to understand Nahjul Balagha and very important part of Nahjul Balagha is these deep uh, you know, questions but inshallah from next session we will talk about Suluk wa Ibadat it's about worshipping Allah and about our conduct and how we can you know get closer to Allah how spirituality and, and you know wayfaring are uh, reflected in natural balala very beautiful discussions we have about worship about degrees of worshipers what is imam ali's understanding of worship about worship of the free people ahrar about their conditions about how they appreciate night and about in night about you know tahajjud and about the things that occur to their hearts about ibadah as a medicine as a remedy and about you know being acquainted with Ibadah inshallah these are the things that in the next section of uh, the book we will discuss we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala
to bless the souls of all our teachers and all our ulama who have great rights upon us and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve for us those who are alive and give them inshallah healthy and tawfiq and lots of inshallah opportunities to keep uh, enriching our minds and hearts inshallah alhamdulillah rabbil alamin Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad and ilahi amin thank you very much shaykhna for an excellent session Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Very good, uh, very good examples you were giving of the respect uh, between Ayatollah Mutahari and Allah Mataba Tabai. May Allah bless their souls. Yes, we have a question from today and a question from last week. Maybe I'll start with the one from last week. Um, and it was regarding the Burhan that was mentioned. Um, and I think you quoted a Quranic verse about if there were uh, La Fasadata. So this question is basically saying, is there a conceptual impossibility in having two gods that agree with each other? And how can we discuss the impossibility of having two gods that agree with each other? Yeah. Yeah, as a, we have said uh, in discussions about Aqa'id, the way we articulate this Burhan is not that they would fight with each other. Some people, you know, discuss, mention it that way, that if there were two gods, you know, they would have, you know, fought with each other. And then some people say, okay, why, what happens if they don't fight each other? We can uh, discuss that approach, but we have totally different approach. And I think I briefly mentioned actually in that session but more detailed uh, are uh, available in our discussions about Tawheed in Aqaid. Basically what we say is that if there were two lords then each of them with their own creation would be separate from each other. There are two problems, and one is how we can have two infinite beings. This is one problem, but the problem of is that when there were two separate worlds, without interaction between them, then this system that we see would not be possible. This order would not be possible. So if, for example, rain was coming from one God and the earth belonged to another God, how can then rain t uh, reach the earth? If one star, one planet was one belonging to one God, another, so how can the light of that one come to here? As I, I think mentioned that if something is in my mind, and something in your mind they cannot interact a car in my mind cannot give a lift to a passenger in your mind because what is in your mind depends on you what is in my mind depends on me they cannot interact so this is the way we articulate burhan Thank you very Thanks much. Very much. Yeah. Uh, we have another question. I've just put it up on the screen. Um, it says, Salam, is this work mostly hidden related to a unique relation between st student and teacher? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, it's speaking about the student teacher relationship and whether it is mostly hidden or is it open and in the public? Um, if that's what you understand from the question as well, Sheikh. This work, which work? So I think the sister is asking about the unique relationship between the student and the teacher. Is it mostly hidden or is it uh, in the public? Of course, uh, the main thing is in the heart, uh, but uh, to some extent should be expressed in the public, if I understood the question. So 
uh, I cannot just love someone in my heart and then don't praise him in the public, don't mention him in the public, don't say I owe him in the public, don't refer people to his work in public. Uh, maybe sometimes, you know, for example, there are situations that, uh, uh, for example, I should, you know, not mention my ustad, you know, too much because they can, you know, uh, some people may feel, you know, I am biased or etc. I don't know, maybe it's sometimes there are some secondary issues, but for sure, when you are in debt to someone or when you respect someone, when you love someone, when you have benefited from someone and you think other people can benefit, naturally you would uh, mention and praise him in front of other people. Actually, this is a very important requirement of gratitude that if I have benefited from something, I would also let other people benefit from that. If there is a book which has been beneficial for me and I am grateful, so I should let other people also benefit from that book. Okay, maybe we can have a quick announcement uh, before we finish off the session with a dua by Sheikh. Um, so firstly, um, if you look at the dates of the sessions, we don't have a session next week. Uh, there will be a one week break. And this is because there will be a program marking the wiladat of Imam al Askari alayhi salam, and we'll be coming back in two weeks' time. And secondly, a request to remember all of the marhumin that we may know who have passed away, especially today there was news of a marhum in Nairobi, in Kenya, who passed away. We pray for him and for all of the marhumin of our viewers uh, who are listening to us today. And um, inshallah, we now follow Sheikh Indua to conclude the session. Allahumma kullu waliyyika al-hujjat ibn al-hasan, salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai, fi hadhi al-sa'ah wa fi kullu sa'ah, waliyan wa hafidan wa qa'idan wa nasira wa dalilan wa ayna, hatta tuskinahu arbaka taw'a wa tumatta'ahu fi ha tawila. وامن علينا ورضاه وهب لنا رأفته ورحمته ودعاءه وخيره اللهم اجعل دعاءنا به مستجاب اللهم اجعلنا همومنا به مكفية وحوائجنا به مقضية وأرزاقنا به مقصود او الله بليز Send the best of your salutations to Muhammad and all Muhammad. Please send your rahmah and maqfara to all mu'mineen and mu'minat who have passed away from the beginning to the end. Especially those who have just passed away, those who are new to Barzakh, those who are dealing with the difficulties of the beginning of this station. Please be extra for giving an extra kind with them. And please give shifa to all people who are ill, especially those who have serious illnesses, those who have no treatment, those who are losing their hope, please give them hope, give them shifa, give them a new life. And please keep ourselves and our families, our communities and humanity safe and enable us to go through this pandemic with hope, with faith, with kindness, with charity, and come out of it quickly and help us to benefit from this experience so that we can be better in our relation with each other, in supporting each other, and make humanity as a whole more united than before and more concerned for well-being of each other than before. Muhammad wa Muhammad. May Allah inshallah be with you and support you and please remember us your du'as and look forward inshallah to connecting with you inshallah bi'ithnallah after two weeks inshallah. Thank you also to Brother Mustafa and everyone who helped. Thank you very much Sheikh and many thank you messages have come through on the chat as well. May Allah bless all of you. Thank you. Jazakumullah khairan. Al-tamasa dua, please. Al-tamasa dua.